Welcome back to part two of lecture 25. We were talking about the Vietnam War and how Johnson will begin to escalate U.S. involvement dramatically after the reported Tonkin Gulf incident. I also hopefully was painting a pretty dire picture for you um, from the standpoint of U.S. troops fighting in Vietnam. They're fighting an enemy that in many cases they have a hard time identifying. They're fighting in a foreign hostile landscape, lots of mosquito-borne diseases and, uh, and issues fighting in, in thick jungles. They're fighting against an enemy who knows how to use lots of different guerrilla tactics to keep their enemy at bay. Uh, what we will see is the United States will begin to use chemical warfare against the Vietnamese in a bid to try and remove the areas in which they may have taken cover. This type of chemical warfare will utilize so-called Agent Orange, which is a potent mix of several different types of herbicides or plant killers. Their goal was to drop from airplanes huge amounts of this type of, of plant killer in the hopes that it would fall on these thickly forested regions and uh, the foliage would die off and it would expose their enemies' locations. Operation Ranch Hand, as it became known, dropped an estimated 19 million gallons of these noxious chemicals over Vietnam. And dropping them from planes is very imprecise, meaning that if the wind is blowing that day in a particular direction, then the chemicals are not even going to land on its intended target. Millions and millions of gallons of this potent chemical a mixture were dropped on agricultural fields. So in the end, it will be civilians, those people that are not taking place in the fighting, they will see their livelihoods literally destroyed by the use of the indiscriminate use of Agent Orange. Not only that, but uh, this is going to induce famine in certain areas as crops are being killed to the ground, people have nothing to eat. Uh, and so we're seeing a, a dramatically bad consequence of the United States deploying all these chemical weapons for such a long period of time. Further, as if things couldn't get worse, uh, you end up seeing the poisoning of groundwater sources. These chemicals do not just wash away. They're there in the ecosystem for years and years following their initial exposure. So what this means is the rate of birth defects is going to start going up among the Vietnamese civilian population. Rates of cancer will start to go up among the Vietnamese civilian population. So there's, there's these dramatic, far-reaching, and terrible consequences of the use of chemical agents in the Vietnam War by the United States. Napalm was also used against not just combat troops for the Vietnamese, but it will also fall on, again, innocent civilians. This petroleum-based sticky substance was dispersed onto vegetation and then ignited, and it burned similarly uh, to gasoline, but it was a slow burn. Anything that it fell on, trees, houses, people, once it was ignited, it took forever to go out. This is one of the most famous photographs taken by journalists during the Vietnamese War. Uh, what you end up seeing is the smoke in the background was a, a village that was bombed, uh, uh, you know, through conventional weapons and also had napalm dropped on it. The napalm was set on fire, and these are innocent civilians running for their lives. Specifically, the girl in the middle of the photograph has stripped her clothes off because napalm fell on her flesh. Her flesh is burning on her back, and she is in agony. Images such as those will appear in newspapers across the country and throughout the world. We will see journalists from the major TV networks in the United States embedded with U.S. troops on the ground during the Vietnam War. So you will see, in many cases, televised footage of the death and destruction happening over in Vietnam being you know, transmitted into people's living rooms every night. As the war continued to drag on now from year to year, 
Johnson only continued to escalate U.S. involvement. He thought if you could just send over more troops, then perhaps that we would reach a tipping point and then the United States would be able to win. However, China, Communist China, is supplying North Vietnam with with weapons. They're supplying them with expertise, with intelligence, reconnaissance on what the United States is doing. So for the North Vietnamese, they can continue the fight, and they do continue the fight for a protracted period of time. And meanwhile, every single night in people's homes, the very first thing they hear when the newscaster comes on is, this number of people, American troops have died today in Vietnam, and still no end in sight. Even President Johnson himself kept three televisions in the Oval Office, one tuned to each of the three major networks at the time, so that he could watch the coverage. And it incensed him. He was so angry that this war was being covered in such excruciating and almost live detail in front of the American public. He blamed the news networks for turning public sentiment against him and the conflict. Vietnam is sometimes dubbed the Living Room War because it is the first conflict that the United States had that was televised, that was covered uh, so consistently and uh, over such a long period of time. And the American public turns against the war, quite naturally, as more and more photos of dead U.S. soldiers begin to pour in as you know, live uh, coverage of uh, American casualties being brought off the battlefield pour in, Americans increasingly begin to ask, remind me, why are we here? Why are we in Vietnam? What are we accomplishing by sending our young men to die overseas? We see the rise of anti-war protests across the country as the conflict continued to drag on. Young university students taking their cue from the civil rights movement began to organize large-scale protests. Civil rights leaders, including Martin Luther King Jr., began to publicly speak out against the war over time as well. In 1967, King made his most public and comprehensive statement against the Vietnamese conflict by pointing out that the war effort, in his words, was, quote, taking the young black men who have been crippled by our society and sending them 3,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia and East Harlem. And again, for the American public, uh, just like they're turning on their TVs every night to see coverage of the war itself, they're also seeing violence erupting in streets here in the United States. Young men begin simply resisting the draft uh, to war. Why fight abroad when we don't get treated fairly here? Muhammad Ali in 1967 was drafted to fight in the Vietnam War. He refused to serve, however, um, basically claiming that this not only violated uh, the principles of his religion, but you know, was not something that touched on his, his life uh, directly. He basically said, I ain't got no quarrel with them Viet Cong. The government prosecuted Muhammad Ali for supposed draft dodging, and the Boxing Commission took away his World Heavyweight Championship title and his license to box. For During the prime of his career, Muhammad Ali, just because he had a conscience and chose to resist fighting in the Vietnam War, during the prime of his career, for three and a half years, he was forcibly sidelined because the federal government took steps to punish him for not participating in the war. The Johnson administration is increasingly feeling the heat from all of this protest, and they will launch an extensive public relations campaign in late 1967 designed to convince Congress, the press, and the public that there was actual progress taking place in Vietnam and that the war was actually being won. Johnson was advised to, quote, emphasize the light at the end of the tunnel instead of battles, deaths, and danger. To this, uh, to this effect, we'll see that the president really begins sort of uh, rolling out the idea that if you can stick with us just a little bit longer, we're about to win this war. And the public believed him. That is, until they see blatant evidence that the president was not being truthful. January 31st, 1968. The North Vietnamese Regular Army and the Viet Cong launched what came to be known as the Tet Offensive, named after the New Year in Vietnam, the Tet Holiday. 
These forces attacked over 100 cities in South Vietnam, including 35 of 44 provincial capitals. The offense included Saigon, the South Vietnamese capital, as Viet Cong guerrillas penetrated the U.S. Embassy compound. Understand that this offensive came just on the heels of President Johnson attempting to reassure the American public that the United States was winning this conflict. This was ample proof to the contrary. 9,000 American and South Vietnamese soldiers perished in this one offensive. 14,300 South Vietnamese civilians died. 58,000 North Vietnamese troops. Americans were stunned and saddened by the Tet Offensive. It was becoming increasingly clear that this war was not going to be winnable, but instead a quagmire, something that you become involved in that just draws you in deeper and deeper with no hope of victory. The Tet Offensive deeply discredits the Johnson administration. People are now are not trusting what their own president is telling them. And this will be part of the reason why Johnson will not seek a second term in office. 1968 is another presidential election year, and the war has defeated him. He's, he's ready to step aside. 